rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, and gout, connected with the dramatic new immunology discoveries that we are seeing almost daily. The world of rheumatology takes center stage in our studio as the doctors are on call tonight. Funding for On Call is provided in part by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding provided by Dakota Care, Regional Health, the Brookings Health System, Dr. Mark Bubach with Dakota Allergy and Asthma, the South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation. Hello and welcome to On Call Television. Tonight is all about rheumatology, which is a clinical subspecialty from the field of internal medicine and pediatrics. Rheumatology deals with diagnosing and treating people who have diseases of the joints, soft tissues, blood vessels, connective tissues, and more. Many of these conditions are the result of an autoimmune process where the body turns against itself, causing self-destruction. And some of these conditions are not autoimmune in nature. Rheumatoid arthritis or lupus erythematosus are autoimmune, for example. And gout or post-traumatic degenerative arthritis are not autoimmune. What is very interesting is that the field of rheumatology is rapidly evolving at this time since new scientific discoveries involving immunology are happening every day. The word arthritis is defined as inflammation of joints due to infectious, metabolic, or constitutional causes and comes from the Greek word arthron, meaning joint. The word rheumatism is defined similarly and comes from the Greek word rheuma, which means that which flows as a river or stream and was first used 2,300 years ago by the Roman Greek physician Galen with the word rheumatismos, defining first rheumatic heart disease and then later arthritis. To help us better understand arthritic conditions is our good friend, Dr. Jim Engelbrecht, a rheumatology internist trained first at the University of Iowa College of Medicine and then rheumatology at the University of Utah. He now practices his internal medicine and rheumatology skills at Rapid City Regional Medical Clinic in Rapid City. Welcome, Jim. Thanks. So, Let's talk a little bit about rheumatology. Uh, you did first internal medicine, Correct. and then you were the chief resident and yeah. started your rheumatology fellowship. I, the, you know, it's medical school, as you mentioned, at Iowa, and then um, internal medicine, so to, uh, you know, as a, as a foundation for all of the um, specialties in internal medicine, whether it's kidney or whether it's pulmonary or cardiology or rheumatology, whatever it happens to be, you have to do the internal medicine which I did at Utah, and part of that I was chief medical resident, and then I did another couple of years of rheumatology on top of that, so it's a fellowship. And as you know, board, you're know, board certified internist, and if you're a board certified internist, you do the fellowship, you can become a board certified rheumatologist. And um, so that's how that all came about. What, what about the board certified rheumatology? Uh, is every rheumatologist board certified, and is that an important thing? Well, uh, you know, I think in this day and age, every board, you know, a real rheumatologist is a board certified rheumatologist, let's put it that way. There's really no reason. There was a time when boards were being developed and they were difficult and they were new and nobody really knew and everything, you know, so people would have board eligibility and, but they would never take, now, there's really no reason that you shouldn't be board certified. I mean, I think every uh, licensing agency going forward and medical staff privileges and things like that, the expectation is you should be board certified in whatever you're proposing to specialize in. Well, if you're a rheumatologist, <clears throat> you deal with joints, but you also deal with skin. You deal with neurologic problems. You deal with pulmonary or lung problems. You 
vascular problems. I mean, you deal with all of internal medicine. Well, that's and and that's kind of what led me into rheumatology. Uh, you know, I was in internal medicine. I really liked the multi organ system diseases and, and, and actually thinking that I was going to have a career in primary care internal medicine and then I became sort of enamored with autoimmune disease and rheumatic disease and uh, because they really crossed all the lines, okay, there was kidney involvement, there was heart involvement, there was joint involvement, there was skin involvement, they could present with, somebody could come in with fever of unexplained uh, origin. Uh, origin and it would turn out it was, it was the onset of lupus or somebody could come in with this new skin rash and it was the onset of some other dis disease. So um, I, it, that was, to me, was uh, put me into a subspecialty but really had to draw on my expertise in internal medicine to be to be a good rheumatologist. Yeah. Uh, you know, but most of us do something because we had a mentor. I mean, we had a hero that kind of yeah. led us in that direction. Did you have one? Oh, yeah, lots of them. You know, I had, you know, in, in, um, in medical school, even before I'd even thought about um, uh, rheumatology, I mean, I had some exceptional people in cardiology, and there was a, there was a rheumatologist at the University of Iowa. This is a medical school. Yeah. Um, uh, Dr. Strotman, who is, who's passed away, but, uh, uh, you know, he, he just his whole demeanor was just such, you know, I just thought so much of him. And, and somewhere that got tucked in my, in my subconscious. And when I was in internal medicine, I met a, uh, I had a professor, Dr. John Ward, who was absolutely the clinician's clinician. I mean, the guy was phenomenal. He was interested, magician. engaging, empathetic, knew how to take care of people, knew how to communicate, knew how to teach, was an exceptional researcher. And I just thought, oh my God, could I, you know, I, I would like to be as close to that guy as I could be in my life. And so, you know, those are the kinds of people that really push you in a certain. Push you in that direction. direction. Now you've done a lot of teaching, yeah. mostly through the, tell me about your teaching experience. Well, teaching is, is uh, you know, we've, we've uh, had medical students since we, you know, I'm starting my 33rd year this summer uh, now in, in um, uh, in Rapid City, so I've been around a long time, so I've seen a lot of students, and we, we established a class. Um, w when I first was there, I took just third year internal medicine students, and they would rotate because I was doing some internal medicine, I was with the internal medicine group, but after about five or six years, I just could not do general internal medicine. I had to really just focus on rheumatology, so uh, instead of taking a junior student and just showing them rheumatology, I said, well, let's create a fourth year medical student elective in rheumatology. And so for 25 years now, we've had um, an elective course. So if you're a senior medical student, you can elect to spend two or three or four weeks with us out in Rapid City and learn rheumatology. And then we also take residents from the family practice residency out there when they want to. It's an elective thing. They can, you know, we have a, a young lady coming up next month who's going to be rotating with us for a few weeks. So um, it's a, you know, it's a, it's it's terrific area to teach because. You know, the general practice of medicine is so full of musculoskeletal joint pain, aching, hurting, fatigue kinds of things that people in primary care need to know about this stuff, you know. What, what would be the most important lesson that you teach uh, uh, medical students and residents uh, in family practice, for example? What illness, what disease do you think they could learn the, the most important from you? Well, you know, I think that um, it's really important that they be able to pick up on, have a good sense of the inflammatory arthritis, by the really inflammatory stuff like rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, spondylitis, psoriatic arthritis, you know, dermatomyositis, those really, those, the, the itises that are really inflamed, inflamed, okay? So that you can sort those out and at least um, get a sense of when you need help and when you don't need help and how should I follow that and what should I do and um, that's a really important thing to teach, and and uh, I'm not I'm not uh, I'm not terribly uh, happy with the with the job we've done. I, I see a lot of I see a lot of things out in primary care where I'm saying why aren't you sorting this out a little bit better before a little earlier? Yeah, you know, and it's again it's it's you know on one hand you have this sort of rush to diagnosis and the tests and stuff. And you know, the essence of rheumatology is listening to somebody, getting that history, and knowing what you're looking for and examining them. And you pretty much know, you know, I'm pretty sure what the diagnosis is before I even order a lab test. 
And some people are so afraid of, oh, this hurts, that hurts, oh, they're just overwhelmed, it's too much hurt, I don't know what to do. So now I'm gonna run and I'm gonna order 16 different lab tests, okay? And, 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 or a bunch of x-rays at the, and, and then you, and then they sit there with, they really don't know what's going on. They don't have a clue exactly what the diagnosis is and they got all this lab work and then there's the variability in the lab work. They're doing this, that, this, you know, and, and then you don't know what to do. So then they throw their hands up and they say, well, I got this and can you see this? And I say, well, what's the clinical stuff? Well, you know, I don't know, but I got this blood test that's abnormal. It isn't the blood test. It's, it's the clinical, it's, right. So you talked about inflammatory illnesses. I mean, those were the ones that are mostly immunologically driven, aren't they? Yeah. Well, the, well yeah. To the mo well, it could be immunologic are the ones that I that, that we deal with in terms of really profound systemic right. disease. Okay, but then there's also crystals can do you know and things like that that can cause. But, but you you were talking about the ones that you wish that they could understand more. Those are those immunological diseases, the rheumatoid arthritis, right. the lupuses. Right. Which of those is do we have the most success in treatment? Well, it's you know the the track record has been phenomenal in rheumatology in the last thirty years. I mean, I've enjoyed in my professional lifetime. Um, a, a change in outcomes and a change in treatment options that has literally changed the disease. I mean, uh, I mentioned Dr. Ward. If Dr. Ward were around today to see what we could do, he would just be, it would just be shocking, okay? I mean, we, I grew up in the 16 aspirin gold shot penicillamine days of the 70s. That worked and not, kinda. That kinda worked, but would, you know, but you, you were always, you know, looking for the damage that it was doing at the same time and then, and then you know, get into some of the stuff we have right now. So I would say, you know, rheumatoid has really changed in terms of uh, the outcome in terms of disability and functionality and less discomfort. And so rheumatoid is very important. Lupus literally has changed from a almost uniformly fatal disease in the 50s and the 60s, the 1950s and 1960s, yeah. to something that almost, you know, not, not quite, but almost has normal lifespan expectations that are, that are going for it right now. Phenomenal changes. And then, you know, some of the lesser known things like spondylitis. I mean, there was a time in ankylosing spondylitis where, you know, I mean, I, I, I can remember many, many times in the 80s and the 90s having a discussion with somebody that, you know, we don't know who's gonna fuse their back spine, yeah. we're going to presume that you're going to fuse yours. And so if you're going to fuse yours over the next 20 years, let's make sure you're at least fused in an upright, good postural position and not all bent over. That was the best we could do. Okay, we couldn't predict. Keep them straight. We can keep them straight, froze. keep them comfortable. And guess what? At some point in your life, you're not going to be able to turn anything or move anything. You're going to move around like this, okay? But at least we're going to have you up here and not like this. So, uh, I mean, and now, you know, if we make the diagnosis and it looks like somebody's got progressive disease, we can get them on something, you know, the anti-TNF drug, something like that, and we can just literally change the outcome and make them functional, productive, capable, you know, people, uh, uh, you know, functioning normally. I mean, yeah. I, I tell people all the time, you probably, I could show you a lot of my rheumatoid patients, ankylosing spondylitis patient, lupus patients, and you, as a doc, would not pick them out of the room. You couldn't pick, you know. And there's a before, time when you and I were in medical school, you could see them from coming down the hall. I mean, they're, they're, That's they're, right. the yeah. hands would go off yeah. on the side, the, yeah. the lateral, I mean, I don't, I have virtually don't see those terrible hands that well, rheumatoid you know, arthritis. You'd come with me and I could show you a few, but yeah. not like we used to see it. <laughs> yeah. It was just to be Huge uniform difference. that way. Yeah. Huge difference. Yeah. Well, I, I think about it, except to also think that uh, all our treatment that we have now for these people are terribly expensive. Yeah. And some people don't have insurance, some people don't have the, the you know, some of that's a real tough, tough deal. But, um, uh, you know, these people deserve that treatment. I mean, I, I, I hope that if, and it isn't that common, so that's why we should have insurance, that's why people should be covered so that they can, they can get this kind of therapy. Well, uh, uh, you, but they're not always needing these very expensive uh, biologics. I read recently where 55% of rheumatoid arthritis are controlled by an inexpensive medicine called methotrexate. Absolutely. You know, and I'm, you know, I'm, I was um, again under the under the tutelage of Dr. Ward. I mean, we started one of the first large-scale methotrexate studies. This was in 19 when I was a fellow. Okay, okay when so I was, I mean, I was part of this. In the in uh, it was in the the late uh, fall and then into the spring uh, of the seventy nine in the spring of nineteen eighty and we were enrolling patients into this study to look at methotrexate. Okay, there have been because there been a smattering of reports. Okay, and so 
in in the summer of 1980, I left the University of Utah. I went back. I went to move to Rapid City. Did all that, and then the next winter, I went back to spend a week in rheumatology and kind of catch up and just yeah. do a little bit. Of, and so I went to the research clinics, and I saw the people a year before that we were putting into this study, and I was like, oh my God. This is unbelievable. Look at these people. Look at this. Look at these people. And so I immediately, when I came back in the spring of 1980, I put the first person on, on methotrexate. And you know, here's, here's the, the kicker. I still take care of that person today, okay? Yeah, and it used to be that rheumatoid arthritis lifespan was shortened. seven years, wasn't it? Well, it wasn't that short, but it was shortened, okay? Yeah. It was shortened by a number of years, okay? So, and, so and they have to be a little bit elderly right now. They could be watching oh, yeah, this show well, right now. I mean. This guy, uh, this particular guy, that that, and I, you know, it's one of those things. You remember certain things yeah. in your career. Where this is the first time I did this, and now look, it, it literally, we passed the thirty-year mark on this thing now. And he is, you know, he was forty-something when he started on it, and he's been on it for thirty years, seventy-something, you know, not years. Yeah. Oh, it's remarkable. And and so, you know, that's a very inexpensive medicine. It's very effective for a lot of people. But you got to know what you're doing with it. You got to give it to the right person for the right reason. Know how to monitor it, you know. And I'm glad to say we've had a good track record through all those times of, of monitoring things, you know. And I know that it can be very toxic too, and certain people will have side effects. You have to be careful, and you really have to monitor these people. Well, that's part of what that's your biggest job, well, isn't it? The biggest the, the the thing is that you know the you know you and I for for decades, not years, months, but decades, we have the argument over the anti-inflammatory medicines and how toxic they are and everything. And my argument always is, if I explain to you the potential side effects, okay, of this medicine, it could do this, it could do that, if it does that, I want you to stop it and call me, this kind of thing, I can avoid, just by explaining it to you, I can avoid a lot of the problems if I don't explain it to you. And say, so here, take these pills, try this for a month or so, and about the third day you're taking them, you're getting a stomach ache, and, and after three weeks, you've got blood in your stool and you're bleeding, okay? Yeah. And, and then they come into the rec home and say, oh my gosh, you know, I took this medicine, look at this. And, but if I told you to stop the medicine, if you have this problem, that gives me an opportunity to try something else and find one that does work and you do tolerate Before it. So get into trouble. communicating about the medicine is very important. Well, the importance of the pa patient, the doctor-patient relationship oh. is huge. You can't read it on paper. I can't give you a piece of paper. I can give you the piece of paper to reinforce what I've told you. But if I said, here, take these pills, here's the paper, see us some other time. It's forget not, about it. It, it. Forget about it. And the other side of that is, uh, I had a patient come in, uh, and he had a little, he has a little carpal tunnel syndrome. He has hypertension. Uh, his mother had some neuropathies, uh, and he got the list of the side effects of the, the hydrochlorothiazide and spironolactone that I had started, and um, it flipped him out. And the lisinopril. How would I possibly use these things together? Uh, well, because they have all these side effects, I can't do it. I can't do it. I said, okay, let's look at your blood pressure. It's terribly high. What other drugs would you like to be on? I mean, we've, we're, you know, there's, there's these other three groups that basically, um, you've got to trust me. The, the writing, the handout that he got, misled him. Right. And so I think that doctor-patient relationship is very important. Well, as you say, the discussion, and you've got to inform them. And you know, the other thing that I think a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of people, even, even people in medicine don't understand uh, but having been involved with so many different research things and drugs over the years, when you're doing a research project on something, you're, and it's being, you know, it's a legitimate research project right. on a new medicine, when that patient comes in to see you in the office, you know, for the follow-up yep. visit, they have to write down anything that they've had yep. since the last time, okay? So they write down, I had an upper respiratory infection, yep. okay? Forevermore, upper respiratory infection will be on the list of possible side effects of this medicine <laughs> if it gets on the market. And that's why if you look at, if you could pick up a, the, the old PDRs that we used to use, it's all on computer now, but you look at that list, they're all the same. It's because people live lives and they get a rash and they get this and I get a bump on the head and I got that and that all has to be listed in there because it's a potential side effect. So the lists are, and so it's they're not even more helpful. important what I tell you than what's on that list. Yeah. Uh, let's let's talk about other issues. Uh, one question would has been to uh, this all this new stuff on vitamin D. Now I know you deal with people with osteoporosis, and I right. I think that the Institute of Medicine has come out with recommendations and said, no question about it, the science is solid, but it's not so solid in all these other fields. You know, we think that there's some heart advantage, there's some cancer advantage, there's some gut advantages, there's uh, stroke dis you know vascular dif differences. Uh, but what's your take on vitamin D? Well, you know, I've been, I've been, um, 
first of all, osteoporosis and metabolic bone disease is sort of a, a subspecialty within rheumatology, but it's also a subspecialty in endocrinology. A lot of very good uh, bone people in endocrinology. There are some nephrologists have sort of ventured into that, so that it, it kind of crosses different disciplines. But, um, but it's kind of fallen probably a little heavier on rheumatology. Uh, and, and again, it's the bone and joint thing and it goes back. But uh, I had a particular interest in osteoporosis even when I was in training. And, and I, um, I did a um, uh, seminar for the, for the rheumatology group as sort of my parting gesture. We all had to do, before we left, we had to do a seminar and really thoroughly research the subject. And I did osteoporosis. This was, 19, this was 1980. And, he had a, and I got in, interested at that point in vitamin D and seeing, you know, that there really were a lot of issues in vitamin D. And, and that was a time when you did a vitamin D level on somebody. First of all, you know, it took about an act of Congress to get a vitamin D. It was so specialized, okay. Yeah. And then in the 80s, it, the, the normals, they didn't really know the normals. So, so you get a normal, it would say normal 7 to 12, okay. And then it would come back in a couple of years, and I would say normal was 12 to 19. And then it would come back, and then the people would study a little bit more, and then normal was, so the normal has changed in 30 years, okay, yeah. because we've known more, we've learned more and more about it. Um, and, you know, I was always a firm believer in, in, in vitamin D, and go back 30 years, we were giving people these big doses of vitamin D before people even talked about it very much, yeah. because, you know, that's, we had very little ammunition for osteoporosis, and we might as well take advantage of the whatever D we could. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, it's just really kind of exploded in the last 10 years, where we have all this knowledge about it. But um, you know, I think it's, it's, a, it's a key part of preventing bone softening for whatever reason. Osteoporosis, osteomalacia, or the metabolic bones, there's a lot of things that can soften bones, okay? It's a key part of the foundation of treating that. If you're going to use one of these fancy drugs that they have these days for this stuff, you know, you, you need to make sure that you got your fundamentals in place, okay? You need the calcium, you need the vitamin D. And again, judicious use of it. I don't believe in, I believe in watching the levels and monitoring the levels. So you don't need to have them excessively high, but you've got to get them up. Probably more than 40, I'm thinking. Certainly well, more like, than 30. I, you know, I, I tell people I'd like to, you know, the, right now the normal, I think the last normal I looked at was like 30 to 90 or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, compared to where that was years ago, it's unbelievable. But I tell people, generally in the world I live in, I like to have people, and again, I'm, I'm seeing more problem osteoporosis stuff than just the run-of-the-mill kind of primary care osteoporosis stuff. So I, you know, 40 to 100 is the range that we try to operate in. 40 to 100 nanograms or some number, whatever I don't know, unit is, whatever it is. It's a standard unit, yeah. I, I don't It's the standard measurement. Our, the New England Journal of Medicine article just came out that talked about looking at vitamin D levels and, os and fractures. And it was very interesting to see, and I don't know, it was, it's this week. Uh, and they looked at, um, they found that they were looking at calcium supplement, vitamin D supplement, uh, and levels. And the answer they came down to was that if you took 800 or more of vitamin D, there was a 30% reduction in hip fractures and a 15% reduction in non-vertebral fractures, whereas the different, the amount of calcium you took didn't make any difference. That's it was the D that made the difference. Now they right. don't have data to say that you, you shouldn't take D and they don't know, I mean, you know, there's some preliminary data to suggest yeah. that there could be some vascular problems. You know, people get calcification of the aortic valve and or, you know, their arteries, does that lead to osteo, or I mean to a coronary disease and so on. Yeah. I think that's an unknown yet, but certainly D is there. So what do you recommend for vitamin D supplement for people? Well, I, you know, there again, I'm, it, it's, it's hard to, to give you a, a single answer because I may see somebody who had several fractures whose bone density is very low and we're doing a number of things and their, their vitamin D level might have been in single digits, okay? Yeah. And so I may be giving that person 50,000 units twice a week for yeah. three or four months and then see what the level is and then adjust it and take it down. Or just as a general rule, if somebody is just otherwise healthy and you need to, you know, how much vitamin D living at the South Dakota latitude where, yeah. you know, you can stand outside naked in, in the wintertime and, and you're you not going to make, you know, <laughs> there's no, there's no sun there, okay? And you're not, <laughs> you're not going to make out, D, okay? And you're not going to so, do it in, in the summer so, either because so, it's so, so hard. So, 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 yeah, and it, well, 
you know. But anyway, six months out of the year, you can make D with the sunshine, and yeah. that's pretty good. So, you know, I just tell people, you know, 1,000 units a day, 2,000 units a day. I mean, that's, you know, maybe 2,000 in the winter, 1,000 in the summer. If you're getting plenty of sun, you're out in the garden, maybe just take it, in the, you know, from October to March, and don't worry about the rest of the time. If you really want to know, you can check a D level, um, you know, for, but, you know, most people don't need to have that done. You know, the Institute of Medicine report, which some people say, oh, well, you take too much D and all that. The Institute of Medicine said less than four, less than 5,000 or 4,000 for sure is safe. Certainly less than 10, possibly less than 10,000 is safe per day. And I mean, I, I'd just say 2,000 for everybody. I mean, yeah, well, I mean, I, we're in the same place with that. And again, yeah, I are. think it depends on, you know, sun exposure and what you're doing and, you know, if you're, a, you know, but, um, there is such a thing as hypervitaminosis D. In fact, it was on one of my boards. Yeah. I had a clinical case of bone pain and it was hypervitaminosis D of all things to turn up on a board exam yeah. years and years ago. But, um, the, the, and so the what do you have to take in hypervitaminosis well, D? I mean, over 10,000 a day. Well, I would, I would think so. But then you start checking levels and they're over 100. And if somebody's over 100, I get them, I, you know, yeah. I cut them down. I don't want them over 100. Right. I don't want to go there. I don't need, I got enough issues with bone pain and joint pain without yeah. creating something, okay? <laughs> so so I, you, you know, check levels and I do too. We check levels and, you know, I'm not, uh, you know, I, I, I um, adjust things and I check them, you know, periodically, but I don't, I'm, I don't obsess on them. I don't, you know, I'm there. And but I have the other thing, and the calcium thing, I think it's worth mentioning. I tell people that most adults need around 1,000 to 1,200 range of calcium a day. And that you can figure this out very quickly. You know, you, uh, a serving of a dairy product is about 250 or 300, okay? So if you've got a cup of yogurt and you drink a cup of milk in a day with cereal and things like that, and you average maybe an ounce of cheese and once in a day, I mean, right there you've got somewhere 700 to 900 a day, okay? And then you take the rest of your balanced diet, excluding dairy, that's another 300. You're there. You don't need to worry about it. A couple dairy things, a good balanced diet. You're the, you don't even take the pills. Don't take the calcium pills. Right. You well, know? they're big horse tablets that are hard to take. It, but if you're, you know, I can't eat dairy, I don't eat any yogurt, I don't eat any ice cream, I don't eat any of this stuff, you know, I'm kind of picky in my diet, I don't eat much meat, and I don't eat this, you know, well, then you might want to take a little supplement. Yeah, 500. I will give you this, uh, that you're the one who talked me into vitamin D. I mean, I, it was on this show, I don't know, four or five or six years ago yeah. that we were talking about it first. And, and I thank you for that lead. <laughs> and so let's talk about um, uh, the fact that um, you do rheumatology. My, my thinking would be that, uh, you know, you must see a lot of old people uh, because you were a rheumatologist and you take care of arthritis mostly, and so most of your patients must be old. Well, see, that's, you know, it's an interesting thing because you say, oh, you take care of arthritis, you just must take care of all these old people. And I say, you know, um, actually being a rheumatologist, I have a very young practice, and people look at me and I say, let me give you some facts here. Average age of onset for rheumatoid arthritis, the bulk of the people, now, you know, 80% of them, mm -hmm. 25 to 50. Average age of onset of systemic lupus erythematosus, 15 to 35. Average age of onset of the symptoms of ankylosing spondylitis, even though most people are, it's a genetic thing, but it usually comes about in the 20s and 30s, okay? Average age of gout, you know, 30, 40, okay? Yeah. Males, primarily. Females a little bit later. Um, so it's average age of psoriatic arthritis, pre-middle age, okay? So my practice is full of people that are 30 or 40, 25, 30, 45, yeah. I mean, that's not. But what happens is because you can manage these things chronically, you, they get old with you. Like yeah. the guy that was 40 when I put him on methotrexate, yeah. he's 70 He's now. 70 now. There you go. So, <laughs> so you, some of them are old. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, there's, uh, but, but there, there is, wear, you know, there's wear and tear, and that's kind of what people talk about, degenerative arthritis, because something deteriorates and then has to be replaced, okay? So the, the arthritis that you see in football players' knees that's degenerative tear. Well, it's, you know, and that is really directly related to a traumatic incident. See, the yeah. repeated trauma, football injury, those kinds of things, or it could have been a car accident and you had to have a rod put in your femur and it doesn't quite track right, and 20 years later you got it. Every other joint in your body is fine, but that knee is shot or that hip is shot or whatever. That's, that is, the, is, is pure a degenerative process that starts with an abnormality in the joint cartilage itself and then, and, it, kind of and then it plays it. out, and, and it's because the joint didn't track right or whatever, and then it, it, it deteriorates. And then there's another form of osteoarthritis that seems to have more of a, a heredit, 
hereditary, a hereditary nature to it in that it's, and it's, it's what we call primary osteoarthritis. And, and you know the people because you've got a practice full of them, I'm sure, but they've got the knobs on certain joints and they're bony knobs. They're not soft, mushy things. They're those hard bones on the DIP and PIP joints. Yeah. And they get knees that hurt a lot of times on the inside. It really hurts and you can feel some bony change. And they get hips that don't want to move right. And they get degenerative disc things and something in their neck. And then the shoulders start. That's primary osteoarthritis. And that tends to show up a little bit younger, surprisingly, too. We see it primarily in the 50s, yeah. people in their 50s. Uh, an inflammatory osteoarthritis that is severe, it's almost like a, a different form of an inflammatory arthritis. It's, it's very difficult, okay? It's an, that, now you're taking something that has ordinarily a low-grade inflammation and you've added something that makes it more inflammatory. And so it's usually some calcium crystals and deposits that makes it it's very difficult to manage sometimes. Uh, let me ask you that. I know that uh, you know, you, those, can, those guys can present with a hot joint almost. You tap it and it isn't gout crystals, it's pseudo-gout crystals. Okay, that's tell, it, yeah. tell us about that. Well, it's, it's confusing because, you know, gout and pseudo-gout, okay? And so yeah. that gets, you know, what's that all do about? Do we have, so, how many shows so, do we so have that we could, I mean, we could go on and on? I know, but you know, there's gout, which is uric acid, and we, you know, we've done a whole show on gout before. We have, we know we've done that. a whole done show on that, gout, right. I mean, what, three years ago, yeah, four years yeah. ago? Yeah, and we should do it again, because it's, it's a changing science. And with, yes. with, with obesity, it's getting worse. So we need to keep that on the burner, but anyway, so we got gout. That'll be our next show. Okay. Pseudo gout. Pseudo, P S E U D O. Pseudo Fake. gout. False. false Pseudo gout. false. So what happened is they said, gee, you know, this looks a lot like gout. And gee, there's something crystal in here, but we, quite, we aren't sure exactly what that is. Yeah. But it's not uric acid. We know that. So we'll say it, it looks like gout, but it's not gout. So we'll call it pseudo gout. Right. Okay. So pseudo gout is, you know, it's been, a, it's a, it's a, a crystal called uh, calcium pyrophosphate. It tends to get embedded in the cartilage. Okay. So it's almost, you know, I, I explained to people that have this. It's almost like I took a little bit of a, of a sand blaster and and just tattooed your cartilage with mm -hmm. this, this stuff. And so we've got all this little crystal in there. And so in the process of sort of normal walking around wear and tear, these little crystals will flake off and body doesn't like that and so it attacks and you get this acute inflammation. Is that the plasma. same as this inflammatory osteoarthritis, this primary osteoarthritis well, you're talking about? Inflammatory osteoarthritis, I mean that is, that is a form of inflammatory osteoarthritis because you end up with osteoarthritis changes but there's been this sort of recurrent inflammation along the way right. and it's also in, important in those cases there are other uh, metabolic illnesses that you need to think about. Make sure they don't have thyroid problems or parathyroid problems or iron problems. There's a host of different things that you need to think about if somebody has pseudogout. The other inflammatory osteoarthritis, though, um, does not have that same kind of calcification of the cartilage, but it has little chunks of calcium different places around the joint doing the same kind of thing, and that's a different crystal called hydroxyapatite. So now we have two different kinds of crystal gouts, or crystal three. Gout, pseudogout, hydroxyapatite. Three different inflammatory osteoarthritis. I mean, you know, well, this two of them are well, and, like and inflammatory. Gout is so inflammatory that gout can look more like rheumatoid in the final analysis. It, it I mean, is so I odd. have people. I have literally had people who were misdiagnosed, quite frankly, with rheumatoid arthritis because it was so hot and inflamed. And it, because they got knots and nobules, and you, you get X-rays, you get erosions, and it's all this stuff, and it turns out it's not rheumatoid at all. It's gout. Yeah. So that's. But so we need to do that show. We need to do that gout show. Well, what do you do for these people with these different kinds of crystals? Crystal things. Well, you know, the, the thing is, first of all, to, to, to make sure that we don't do the wrong thing, that we don't say, gee, this is rheumatoid or this is something, and, and we start giving you some of this expensive stuff that you talk about, yeah. and it's all risk and no reward. Okay? I mean, there's that's, no reward, and that's, you turn off That's the right. You're gonna, I'm going to give you a medicine that yeah, we got the wrong diagnosis, and I'm going to give you this medicine for the wrong diagnosis. My God, that's the worst you could do. Okay? And it's I mean, you very know. expensive, and it causes liver disease well, and all these other problems. So you got to have the right diagnosis, and that's why you have people call rheumatologists <laughs> in this world, so that people can sort this stuff out and say, this is my best guess. And when I can't figure it out, I have people that are places like Mayo and University of Iowa and University of Utah, and I call them up and I say, I can't figure this out, okay? Yeah. So Rick couldn't figure it out. He sent them to me, and I can't figure it out. Can um, you help me? Yeah. So okay. That, that's the way it should so be. So you've got to figure it out, get the right medicine, 
And then with these crystal things, it really comes down to using anti-inflammatories judiciously. And some of them, you know, you would agree with and some of them you won't agree yeah. with. But, um, and sometimes you even have to use some steroids. And, sometimes, you know, and the good news is that there are some, well, the good, the good news is, if you don't mind cost, but the good news is that there are some of these biologic meds that are being targeted now towards some of these inflammatory osteoarthritis processes. Yeah. And there's, there are some that are actually even out right now that have been shown to be some, of some benefit in those cases, although they're not approved for that yet. Let's go to Phil Mickelson, the golfer. There's been a lot said about this guy, and I didn't know this, but I heard about it when I'm looking into this uh, show with you. Uh, what's, what's his diagnosis, and, uh, and how fabulous was his therapy, of course, and tell me about it. Well, it's, you know, the, the, uh, I, don't, I have no personal knowledge of He's not his situation. Friend. He's not my patient, okay. Uh, but he sa as, as he says on TV, on the commercials, I have this thing called psoriatic arthritis, okay? And there is this thing called, and unfortunately it's not one thing. It's the, the, in the whole category of psoriatic arthritis, there are a number of different like entities. Like five different kinds of There's things. five different kinds of psoriatic arthritis, okay? So let's talk about what's, you know, psoriasis, okay, is the skin disease. Right. And it's a very dramatic skin disease. And it can be a couple of little spots in your scalp, or it can be like all over the place. I mean, you can have 75, 80 percent, percent of, your of your body, body with these vile, these purplish silver plaques that are just obnoxious and yeah. hurt and itch and you know drive you crazy. Right. That's psoriasis. That group of people that have psoriasis also have a higher uh, incidence of a variety of different kinds of arthritis. And the, f and the fact is most people start with, uh, most being like 75%, will start with the psoriasis first and then they'll get the arthritis later. So you somebody will, yeah, I've had psoriasis since I was a, you know, 50, you know, 25 or whatever. Now the 35 come in with a swollen knee. So there's, there's a kind that looks just like rheumatoid arthritis, but, it, but the blood tests are negative, okay? And, they, and, and so that's, called, that's sort of a seronegative, we call that. And then you have just, you know, you've got two common diseases, psoriasis and rheumatoid arthritis, it's gonna end up in the same person, not necessarily connected, but it's seropositive rheumatoid and psoriatic, okay? And then you have a kind that's spondylitis that affects just the, the spine. spine. And then you have a kind that we refer to somewhat as asymmetric or posse articular. In other words, it's a few joints, posse means a few. So, and it's very, it's like a wrist and an ankle and a knee and a shoulder. Or it's a finger and it's a toe and it's a shoulder and it's right. a knee, okay? It's just, and every other joint is fine. Every other joint is fine. And then they got the psoriasis, okay? Uh, I think that's what he had, okay? I think that's, I don't know, Phil Mickelson yeah. from Adam, yeah. okay? But that's, I think that's, he had the posse articular kind, but, but I could be wrong on that. I don't know, I have no authority to say what he has at all, okay? And then there's another kind, what's called mutilans, which is a very destructive, I mean, it just eats bones and joints and everything. I have never, ever seen a case of it. I've only read about it, never have seen it, okay? So you've got to figure out, first of all, what, which one am I dealing with here, okay? And then how best do I get after that? You mentioned methotrexate with rheumatoid. Methotrexate is sometimes appropriate. There's a sulfa drug called sulfacelzine, sometimes appropriate. But the big change in psoriatic arthritis are these anti-TNF medicines, Humira, Enbro, Remicade were the big three. There's a couple more, some yeah. Zeosymphony now. TNF and that, meaning? And TNF is a factor that's involved in inflammation, and it stands for tumor necrosis factor. It's got nothing to do with tumors. It uh, has a lot to do with necrosis, and, no, and, and it's a factor. Okay, yeah, some <laughs> so, factor out there. But it's just that's what's called TNF, and it's better just to think of it as TNF. Mm -hmm. And it's it oh. is a major factor in how the body promotes inflammation, and and so what these drugs do is they interrupt that process by very very novel means. Okay, there are some that are antibodies that pull it out. There's some that compete with it, but they're very interesting drugs but they really are life-changing. I mean, to, to think that somebody could have psoriatic arthritis and compete in, at the PGA level is it athletically good? tells you all you need to know about how important these drugs are. And that's why he was a good person to have as an well, advertisement. Yeah, that's um, I was interested in um, uh, the question about uh, what kind of uh, herbs and spices and copper bracelets and copper uh, copper bracelets and soap under the mattress and 
cherry juice and worms and parasites and other different things that people are using. I, 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 re I remember meeting a lady when I was selling knives door to door in Madison, Wisconsin, a thousand years ago before I was a physician. Knocked on them and she came in with rheumatoid arthritis. And she, uh, and I don't know, I got her to buy a couple knives for me. You, I was a Cutco you, knive. You doubled. So, yeah. You had. <laughs> but um, I have to say that uh, in the conversation she told me she didn't believe in any of these uh, regular doctors and that she was completely in complementary medicine. She didn't say complementary, she used herbs and so on and so forth. What do you think of all those? Are they all hooey? Is there some credibility there? What is the truth on copper bracelets? Let's start with copper bracelets. Well, let, let's just, let's, let's do copper bracelets. Let me just step back one step uh, just to give you a perspective, uh, a couple perspectives. First right. of all, everything we've been talking about in the, sh the show tonight, all these different kinds of arthritis, okay, you, you can just intuitively know, anybody would know, we're not gonna find one switch to turn off and all these different things are gonna go away. These are all different processes, okay? So there's not just one thing. Second thing, and very important thing, okay, is that a lot of forms of arthritis are cyclical in the sense of the activity. And so if you take a new onset rheumatoid, they'll tell you how it started and what they noticed and then all of a sudden they felt they felt better for a while and then oh my gosh it got worse again and then I got better again so on and its, it's own and it's so on its own before anybody's doing anything no, no copper braces, you know well no. how come you didn't come in six months ago well I felt better for two or three months and yeah. you know and so if you look at these diseases you find out that maybe 25 or 30 percent of the people the nuance of these diseases have a cyclical course where they're better on their own and they get worse and then all of a sudden it remains it, whatever you're doing, when you get better, you presume that you will go. I mean, if you know, if, if you're eating, you know, the 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 white raisin soaked in gin, the Paul Harvey cure, yeah. or whatever, and you and feel you better, better for two months, you're going to tell the whole world, "Well, I got the cure here." Okay. Yeah. And so it's the, it's a disease. The, these the various arthritic diseases are sort of set up to have a lot of false stuff, and that's why you have all of this garbage out there. Okay. Now. Our job is to sort through the garbage and find out if there's some treasures in this trash, okay? Yeah. And and let's talk about copper bracelets, okay? If you were a copper company and and you mined copper, you'd be very interested in knowing, oh, we could do this once. Well, Kennecott was very interested in this years and years ago in Utah, and they did, there were some studies that were done. No effect, okay? None on any kind of anything, osteoarthritis from the, Don't so the copper bracelets, other than making your wrist green, it's all in your head, okay? Doesn't period, work. put it away. Okay, done, all right? Um, there's all kinds of the, the raisins and gin and different things like that. Forget about it, doesn't work. Listen, you'll have people who will swear on a stack of Bibles that it worked for them, I'm happy for them, okay? That's good. Whatever they had, it got better, terrific, good. There are some things like ginger and turmeric and some of these other things, some of these herbs that do have anti-inflammatory processes, okay? Right. And so, you know, you could, you could see where that may work a little bit. There are some things in cranberry juice, there's some things in cherry juice, some things that we don't know exactly. It's not just exactly the citrate in there. It's not exactly, we don't know what it is exactly. Seems to have a little anti-inflammatory thing, may work for some of the crystal things. That seems to work. Um, you know, there was the whole thing with tetracycline, antibiotics, oh, yeah, so you I, could cure it, okay? You know, and there's clinics built around these things, okay? And what and, and the, the fact of the matter is that they've never been able to fulfill Koch's postulates where you could actually prove that the infection caused this, caused that, was treated with aminocycline, and you could recreate it. You never can do that. It's been tried for 60 years to do this, and you can't do it. What they found out, though, is that minocycline, tetracyclines in general, that molecule inhibits some of the inflammatory proteins. And so there are studies right now with non-antibiotic tetracyclines that inhibit these proteins because it's not the antibiotic, it's the molecule that's interfering. So there is a little something that can right. cut some inflammation with these, but it's not that you're treating an infection. Yeah, I have, I have, I have seen doxycycline help on some people who have had arthritis, but it isn't because it's an antibiotic. I, you else. know, I have taken, you know, atypical early onset rheumatoid seronegative in younger people and said, you know, we got nothing to lose by trying a little bit of this. Maybe, it, maybe it'll work. And we've had a smattering of success over the years. But, but that might have been the cycle. I mean, thing. I can tell you for, for every one I've had like that, I've had a hundred that, uh, you know, it just didn't, didn't work. Didn't so work. 
Um, and then the other thing is glucosamine and chondroitin. You hear a lot about that. And and, uh, and, and we, we have talked back and forth on that over the years yeah. uh, as we've discussed it. And you've been supportive of well, I, some you know, of that. The, the, the original theory of this goes way back to 1969. So this is, this, this is not something that just, you know, fell off the truck last week. This is yeah. something that old has been around, been around for a long time and it's and it's never been clear cut except if you look at every time there's a study um, when you look at big populations, you can't really demonstrate a, a, a big difference, but there always seems to be a subset of people that seem to be better and You've had patients, I've had patients come in and say, you know, I did try that and it makes better. And my take on it and my read on all this is that there's about maybe a 25% responder rate to people taking glucosamine and chondroitin. So 25% okay. of the people will respond. And, and with osteoarthritis, with osteoarthritis, wear and tear osteoarthritis, not yeah. rheumatoid. I mean, None rheumatoid is too far off the, off the yeah. inflammatory track to mess around with this stuff, okay? Yeah. But wear and tear, you know, I'm 50 some years old and I can feel it on my knees and you know, right. this kind of thing. And what I tell people is to just to take, I give them the dose, take 1,500 to 2,000 milligrams of glucosamine and the chondroitin a day for 90 days. Put the combination chondroitin and the glucosamine. Yeah, you know, because it, it goes, uh, you know, for a while they said, ah, oh, chondroitin's not important, then glucosamine's not important. I said, just take them both. They're innocuous. They're not going to hurt anything. Try it for 90 days. Three months. Three months. Right. Okay, at the end of three months, you be objective about yourself and say, do I feel better? Can I move better? Do I have less pain out of it? And if you do, we'll stay with it. That's fine with me. If you don't, let's get, we, we can put that away and we're done with it. Yeah. And I can say it over the years of doing this, I would say maybe 20, 30% of people have some level of responding to that. And then the other people don't have to waste their time and money fooling with it. Mm -hmm. And to take it a little bit, oh, I took a couple pills this day and then last week and then I forgot it last week. If you're gonna do it, do it. Do it for three and months. And then, def then define your outcome. And if your outcome is, uh, can't tell, Count. forget about it. For forget about it. Forget about it. So what about, uh, I mean, uh, the field of immunology right now, the, the uh, allergists are being uh, inundated with the hygiene theory. In other words, uh, they, there's been a lot said about uh, that we've lived for uh, all these years as human beings with hookworm. And uh, when we got away from the hookworms uh, and we knew to have latrines and wear shoes and not stomp around in, in the, the area where people were, uh, were uh, having their uh, toileting, that uh, people had a lot less infectious problems, but the allergies came on. And they've, there's been some smattering of data about um, uh, inflammatory bowel disease in certain worms. Uh, and uh, that certain people will take some worms and their inflammatory bowel disease goes away. Now these are all immunological kind of things. You're Mr. Immunology. Oh no, I'm not Do Mr. Immunology, I'm Mr. Rheumatology. Okay. Uh, you know, immuno I mean, this, that whole area is really way inside the immunologic framework that is really, uh, you know, it's just not something that and the rheumatology people aren't talking about this no, stuff right now. No, no. Okay. You know, I mean, it's it's uh, you know, I, I you know, it's I, I get kind of brushed by information on it, but I'm don't. Okay. You know, I'm I'm just not there with that. All right. Now, for we got about two and a half minutes. Let's talk about osteoarthritis. What people can do for their plain old garden variety, most common arthritis that occurs as people age. What you know, uh, you know that I'm 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 reluctant to encourage people to take non steroidals over the counter. Uh, ad lib every day. I like to have them uh, suggest, I would suggest uh, if you use um, naproxen or uh, Aleve or Advil, ibuprofen, that you do it periodically and not on a heavy regular basis. Uh, and Tylenol can cause kidney problems and liver problems as well, but um, those are the things that I would suggest. Where, where are you with that whole world? The, the Sitting down talking to, a, a, say, a 50-something-year-old female would be the typical new onset osteoarthritis. Uh, several things that we talk about. Number one is um, they need to try to maintain a normal body weight, okay, because we know that obesity changes your metabolism and that has an effect on the outcome in osteoarthritis. So we right. talk about weight loss, maintaining normal body weight, very, very important if you've got osteoarthritis. We talk about exercise, okay. Now, if you've already got some wear and tear, 
I'm probably not going to send you out to the tennis court and start exercising, right. okay? Maybe the elliptical is for you or maybe the swimming, but you need to figure out something that gives you some regular exercise on a regular basis. Walking. Keep those joints moving, learn to stretch. If you can't do very much, do, learn a little Tai Chi, but keep those joints moving. Get them out there so they can move. Third thing is, um, if you want to mess with the chondroitin, glucosamine, try a little right. bit of that. The uh, you know, that's, and, and I'm kind of, you know, um, I'm closer to you maybe on the anti-inflammatories than you even realize, but I tell people that if you're going to use a naproxen, okay, let's use it and get the effect, and then when things settle down, let's get off of it, okay? And then Tylenol and things like that. So that's kind of, that's, a, that's the basic. Standard practice, we like that, but very good. Most of the time, making the diagnosis takes an informed and observant doctor, not a blood test or an x-ray. Mr. Z was a strapping man of 40 and came into the office with pain primarily in his fingers. Other than the scaly, silvery skin rash over both elbows, which had bothered him for years, and the painful fingers, which had bothered him for a month, Mr. Z had been pretty healthy all of his life. His brother struggled with uh, similar skin patches involving the scalp rather than the elbows, and a school teacher had called his uh, rash ringworm years ago. Neither one of the brothers had seen a doctor for the rash. On examination, our patient's painful joints involved several of the fingers, causing such inflama inflammation that they looked like a swollen link sausage. The fingernails had pits like many tiny drill holes scattered through the affected fingers. He explained that not only was he hurting his fingers, but also in his toes. And lately, he had low back stiffness and a progressive overwhelming fatigue. We know that the skin condition of psoriasis occurs in 1 to 3 percent of the population, and that from 5 to 30 percent of those with the rash will develop one of several kinds of psoriatic arthritis. We know that both conditions are triggered by genetic or environmental or immune system factors. We also know that if we turn off the immune system and more specifically T helper cells with complex and powerful medicines in most cases, we can radically reduce the pain of psoriatic arthritis. But with all that scientific talk, still the diagnosis of psoriatic arthritis in Mr. Z is made clinically. In other words, it's by the way this man's story unfolds, along with his physical exam that makes the diagnosis. Although supportive lab tests will be ordered, there is no diagnostic lab test or x-ray for psoriatic arthritis. This is the way many diagnoses are made in the field of rheumatology, simply by the story of the patient's illness and by the so-called bedside physical examination. To say it again, Making the diagnosis takes an informed and observant doctor, not a blood test or an x-ray. So let's say that again. You said this already. It's interesting. I wrote this essay this last week. Mm -hmm. You came up with this uh, without having read this essay. Um, it's not just in rheumatology, though, is it? No. It's, it's you know, I think that there's this the sense that, that somehow you've got to hurry up and get to that diagnosis. So like if there's something wrong with the person, if they don't figure this out and come up with something, and so you order all these things. And, and I, you know, I, I tell the students and I tell the residents when I get a chance, you know, uh, in primary care you're in a perfect situation where somebody comes in and, and you say, well, let's, you know, you check them over and you try a couple of things and let's, let's, let's make sure that your blood counts are okay. You try something very simple as part of the general health. And, and you know, if you're not feeling better in a couple of weeks, why don't you come back in and, and let's see if some, something's developing here. That doesn't happen, okay? They order Every God, test under how the much sun. stuff. I mean, I get the stuff and I, you know, some of these things, I don't even know what they are, okay, <laughs> that they're ordering, okay? But they, they looked it up, you know, up to date, and they looked up some computer thing and they gave them a list and a blah, 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 and the bill was 2,000 bucks for lab tests, none of which helps us at all. Well, that closes our rheumatology show. I sincerely thank our studio guest, Dr. Jim Engelbrecht from Regional Medical Clinic in Rapid City for helping answer our questions tonight. We'd love to have your feedback and suggestions. Please go to online to 
oncalltelevision.com and be sure to share the site with your friends, oncalltelevision.com. Astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson shares a good quote of life. He said, for me, I'm driven by two main philosophies. No more today about the world than I knew yesterday and lessen the suffering of others. You'd be surprised how far that gets you. We thank you so much for joining us, Jim. Welcome. Until next time, stay healthy out there, people. for On Call is provided in part by Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting and by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota additional funding provided by Dakota Care Regional Health the Brookings Health System, Dr. Mark Bubach with Dakota Allergy and Asthma, the South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation.